Hello, so here we are in Rome, rather the Roman Empire and Roman chapter. Uh, before, you know, we had maps with a bunch of names that were hard to pronounce. The main thing we want to be aware of here is just the size of this empire and where consistency played a strong role in the spread of Egyptian culture, Egyptian art, Egyptian way of thinking. There's some other things that really go into play here, and we're going to see a differing role for arts as well as uh, some interesting uh, some interesting things happening. Whereas the Greeks with the brains, uh, by and large, the Romans might be read as the drains copying on uh, some of what the Greeks established. And while the Greeks uh, were no doubt in incredibly vast in their empire, the Roman Empire could be seen as even larger um, before the split or even after the split. Where Rome shines uh, in terms of innovation, uh, one might say that it is architecture that really stands out. Uh, of course, we have the dome and drum construction, and vaults are new whereas arches arches are not new it is the vault which is one of the really big things that makes uh, the architecture in this chapter so incredibly complex so interesting as well as the materials used in those uh, buildings you know so someone decided you know if I take an arch and put another arch beside it dude what if I keep making arches I've got a vault and when those vaults meet each other, you have tunnels and really all kinds of possibilities. When we look at architecture, we're first going to look at domestic or private architecture, that is the home. And if you look back in your chapter, if you have the book, if you've read it, uh, you'll see that there are some key places for the Roman home. That's probably best seen here uh, in the atrium, the impluvium, the, impluvium, the backyard. Uh, when we think about when we think about uh, the home and the functionality of it, uh, well, um, it's it makes a lot of sense. So you've got the impluvium, and notice here how the roof uh, kind of focuses in on that center space, catching the water, which then can be used for well, drinking, washing, work, whatever you need. And around the impluvium are these windowless rooms. Hmm, not very original. The, the Greek space was more open, but, you know, thinking about the Etruscans, uh, maybe they just liked more closed spaces. Maybe it was just the architecture and the engineering. But by and large, many of those rooms around the impluvium and the main home were closed. And these rooms, we still use that name today, and they are cubicula, which is known now as cubicle. Um, in the front. So let's say, you know, the family lives here, then when they went to work, they just come out through the atrium into their tabernum, or where we get the word tavern. So he can sell his wares at the end of the day, kind of close up shop, come back here, you know, get a little food, have a little fun, and then, you know, just enjoy, enjoy the backyard, enjoy that park, and, you know, have your feast. It's rather really a rather nice way to live except for the fact that you know the place doesn't have windows um, you might have a couple of windows up top but not everyone had multi-story um, homes at the time moving on uh, architecture for public spaces not private this is where we kind of can see some of the influence of the Greek uh, buildings and all of this comes from the Agora and if you have if you've ever been to a live uh, space, open air flea market, or swap meet. Um, I was always impressed and amazed with the uh, some of the swap meets out in Los Angeles, how sprawling and how they just kind of take over. It's really amazing those spaces. Sometimes it seems like there's no organization at all, but here, as opposed to the agora, the gathering place, the forum gives us a little organization. And that is most easily seen here. Now, if I go to one of the uh, one of the uh, larger images here, let me see if I've got it. 
here we go. So, you know, you take a space and you surround that space with columns. Now, while that might have a strong effect for status, it also has a really functional effect, and that is to direct people. It encloses that space. It lets people know, oh, let's gather and set up shop within this space. And it's very practical because people can come in and come out without being hindered by walls and too many obstructions. At the head of that gathering space, you have a building, which could be, you know, in some cases, a courthouse a shrine or what have you, a temple. You know, here in the forum there were many different buildings, but notice how all of these gathering spaces have, you know, they serve as a body and then they have a head on one side uh, for focus. And we'll get even more into that. We'll get into more detail of, of that in the next couple of slides. And this is really going to lead into uh, an influence for Christianity and directly the shape of the Christian church. And that'll make more sense once we move into the next chapter. So from the Agora, we look now at the head of one of those gathering places, the Basilica, which again comes from a Greek word. Are you picking up the, the trend here? Uh, you've got the front porch, you've got the main gathering area, and to the side you have the, the apse, and that will change. And then you have a column, which would be a place of focus, perhaps a celebratory or commemorative piece of sculpture or architecture, or in some cases it could be simply be a statue as an, as an idol, a god, something of worship. Moving to another public space, we can look at the markets of Trajan. Now, mind you, this is an ancient building that was multi-storied. 2,000 years ago, they were making multi-storied shopping malls, shopping sp public spaces this complex and this vast. And the interesting thing that's happening here is it's built, by and large, on the strength of the arch. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, if we look closely, we can see those arches, you know, filling all these different places. If you look down at the bottom, you'll see very large, thick arches. And then above them, some medium-sized arches. And above them, smaller arches. So in a way, it seems like they're, it doesn't seem like they're using load-bearing, load-bearing construction. You know, wide base, getting smaller as it gets higher. And as well as these new techniques with arches and the new materials, the concrete, the tufa, the marble, and everything else. It's really rather interesting and impressive when you think about it. Here's another view. Uh, you can see the arches up close, and then you see a column, which could be Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian. If you think about it, you will realize that it is, in fact, Corinthian. Another public space is the baths, and if you have the textbook, you know that the sun is going off in this direction. Uh, south is down here, north is more top left, and that would influence the function of the building. In the early in the early chapters of this book, function and form are really apparent. They're readily apparent, and it's easy to think about. And so I want you to think about why would you have multiple baths throughout? Uh, wouldn't you want one big bath? Well, it depends. Some people like hot baths. Some people like cool baths. And if you think about it, having this one bath here on the south and southwest side, it gets the most sunlight it's going to be the hottest, which is why it, of course, is the caldarium. Think of caldera and volcano. Now, people might think that the coolest is going to be here because it's got northern. It has no direct light. It's on the north side. It's going to get a breeze, and it's cool. But that's not true because even if it's on that outer edge, it's going to get some warmth. So this is the swimming pool, just right for a lot of people. The tepidarium. The tepidarium is going to be the lukewarm kind of middle in between. It's It's got the coolness kind of coming from this direction. It's got the hotness because it's right next to the caldarium. And it's, you know, kind of the best of both worlds. Whereas the frigidarium is going to be the coldest of the baths, the coldest of those areas. Because it's in the center. It's so insulated away from the heat. And the closest it is to the outside is, again, from the north. So it's... It's insulated against all of that southern heat, and this is 
really ingenious for this time. 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the, the, the HVAC people. They didn't have the electricity, the control of all that. They were using their architecture and really some good engineering. Looking at these baths, you can see how massive they were. I wanted you to see this, uh, these images for scale. And something else that's interesting about this is the complexity of their bricks, of that engineering and the architecture. Now, what's so impressive about bricks? Well, hopefully, you will understand when you see here. We normally think of the bricks and masonry and those massive blocks as just that. Massive, massive blocks. But what are they doing here? Instead of making massive blocks for their arches, they've made very thin bricks or thin tiles for their arches. And this allows them to make very subtle arches. Typically, we think of an arch as being this perfect half-circle curve, but here, by manipulating the thickness of the bricks as it goes across, they can make wider expanses. Those wider expanses allow for a different flow of air through the different chambers or through uh, the outside inside. Uh, it changes the nature of air flow. And uh, again, it goes back to the really interesting engineering that, that made these buildings so impressive and effective. Perhaps, though, the most famous of the buildings in, in the Roman Empire, of course, is the Colosseum. And as I sit back in my chair thinking about uh, the Super Bowl, uh, it's easy to understand why people would gather in a place to see men or well, see people fighting and hurting each other and just going toe to toe wanting to see that blood and you know why would why would you want to go to a place to see to see Christians die or to see slaves die or to see animals die man against animal and man against so many other things well, why do we want to see horror movies? Why do we want to see scary movies or see football? Or why do people go to uh, car? Why do why do people go to car races just to see the wrecks? Mm. Well, when when we try to have this conversation about at least one piece, let's try to understand, and then it's not so hard to understand why people would go there. Now. Getting back to the technical nature of this, I want you to be aware of how it seems to slant. That's not a trick of the eye, that's not a trick of the lens, it is made to slant. And that is so, it will hold itself together. Please remember that these buildings were built in a region that was prone to extreme geologic activity, namely earthquakes or volcanoes. And so by uh, by having the building lean in, think about it, it's a, it's a circle, so each stone in that circle serves as a keystone to every other part of that circle, that donut shape. So, uh, hopefully that makes sense. If, if, a, if the building was straight up and down, as it appears here in this diagram, any kind of shaking would make that fall away. But because it is, in fact, leaning in, it holds its shape in that circle, in that semicircle, and it keeps it strong, which is why this building, which housed or saw so many people uh, to celebrate, to witness, to uh, enjoy the thrill of whatever was on display, it could last so long under all of that wear and tear. Obviously, it has suffered some over the years, but it is still a testament to the Roman engineer and their designs. So we have the scale, we have the nature of it. If you look on the outside, you will see the Doric, Ionic, Corinthian columns, as well as a very interesting cornice. This, this uh, theme here, this progression, is going to pop up several times from here until the early 20th century. Um, I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, hold that, put that in the back of your mind as we look at the future chapters. Uh, of course, many people came here. Um, you might have seen that movie, the not Spartacus, the Gladiator movie. Yes, it did have a tarp. It did, you know, so they could they could see their sport in the rain under the hot sun and still enjoy it with uh, relish. 
or without relish, who knows. Uh, <laughs> it was built on top of a... Uh, it was built on top of a dried out pond, and that pond allowed for good sewage of blood, water, what have you. It could be flooded, it could be drained, and the false floor could be built on, and the areas beneath could house slaves, animals, you know, victims, warriors, what have you, to literally come up through the floor. Some of those embellishments in, th in Spartacus, not Spartacus, I keep saying Spartacus, um, in Gladiator were not so far off which makes this building all the more impressive. Now, um, from bloody fare to more practical fare and more wet fare, we have the aqueduct. And the aqueduct is another marvelous feat of engineering. It uses, without a doubt, that load-bearing construction, starting with the heaviest, going to the medium, and then going to the lightest. And those arches serve to carry water you know, not through the river or from the river, but over the river. Not only that, it served as a road for soldiers. And these aqueducts, these thousands of years old aqueducts, are still in service in some areas. This, of course, being the Pont de Garde, one of the most famous aqueducts of all time. By no means the only aqueduct, but perhaps one of the most famous. The really impressive thing about this aqueduct and many of the others is dressed stone. That's not a stone wearing a dress or any other kind of clothing. It is cut so well and fit and fit in place so well it needs no mortar. That is what dressed stone means. And that's incredibly impressive when you think about the time, the snow, the ice, the the fact that the power tools and the Home Depots and, you know, Granger, they weren't around to help make these perfectly cut stones. They had masons, they had craftsmen to craft these incredible stones that served and continue to serve. Um, from the public spaces now to a more uh, private or different public space, the religious building. Religion, of course, played a strong role in Roman life. We won't get too much in, into the mythology. Of course, we do need to understand some of the differences between their gods. But mainly, we want to look at this one building, which is seen by many as the ultimate in all Roman architecture. We have so many in incredible feats coming together in this. If you read the chapter or looked at the diagrams, you will see there is a perfect circle inside a square. While that may not seem like much, what they have done here is built a sphere inside a cube. Thus the dome sits on top of not a drum, but a round drum as well as a box. If we look at the outside, you can see what I'm talking about. The top of this dome does not have keystones, rather it is open completely. And the beams of light do stream in and transform this place. Rain literally does pour in, uh, and that was intentional. One of the really interesting things about this is, while it may have images or sculptures of saints, it originally had images of the Roman Pantheon, and that is the name of the building, the Pantheon. It had the images, the sculptures of the gods, and the one god above them all in Greece would have been Zeus, but in this case it is Jupiter. And if you think about it, and there is a perfect circle, a sun disk, which is often, you know, associated with gods. You have this sun circle looking down, and the light of that circle move, moves across the room, creating a very strong interactive element to this space. It changes it. And so the eye of Jupiter, which is what this is known as, m changes the space constantly. On a bright day, you become aware of that beam of light shooting down. Imagine how you might have been if you were a simple citizen uh, walking in and the light shone down upon you or upon the space where you were standing. It would be, it would be a transformative space. So let's look at a quick view around the inside and you can see how rich, how marvelous the space is. You have marble, not just white marble, but brown, blonde, red, black, mm, dozens of different types of marble from all around the empire. 
this shows off the wealth, the majesty, the power, and the means that is Rome. Caesar found it a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. Now part of this is cordoned off, and I'm going to explain why. While I'm looking at this slide, I would like to explain that there are two types of columns. Oh, Mr. Fernandez, you told me there were three. Well, there are two types here. And if you read the chapter, you might understand what I'm talking about here. There's a column that is freestanding, a column that is independent, and then there is a column that is attached to a building. The correct term for that is engaged. It is engaged with the, the structure connected to it, and so it is not, you know, independent. Um, the building put a ring on it, perhaps. Uh, we also have not a column, but a pilaster. So I just want to remind you of those terms. Keep those ideas fresh in your head. We're still going to be using them. You have Corinthian columns and Corinthian pilasters. As well, one is engaged, one is not engaged, and both are made from different types of marble. Now, in the next slide, you will see uh, why this area in the center is cordoned off. That is because of these little holes in the floor. So whenever it starts raining, the water drips in and it drains into this floor here and, uh, and finally into the sewers. Please pardon the creepy photobomb guy. There's always one person that just wants to stand out and look at you and be a jerk. Sorry. <laughs> um, Rome, much like Paris, is known for its vast sewers and catacombs, and the catacombs will play a strong role in the next chapter for the Christian faith. Um, this is the Pantheon. So, moving on from it, we will look now at another type of public space, the commemorative space, the commemorative building, which is the Arapacis, the Arapacis. I'll take either pronunciation. I'll understand what you're trying to talk about. This this piece of architecture is really more fitting with Roman art in general. It is, uh, you know, if you if you read the first couple of pages, it talks about how Roman art is commemorative. It celebrates, and it uh, as well as decorates. Here we have a celebration of peace under Augustus, and on the bottom you have plants. On the top you have a procession of people. The people have been organized through isosophily. Remember, remember what that is. That means to organize a space with a level of heads. The people can be doing all sorts of things, talking, carrying, carrying on, but they are organized around visually by the level of their heads. Now, you have the procession of people, which were actual people at this procession, celebrating Augustus kind of like a people's magazine or who's who. Did you see what Tiberius was wearing? Did you see what Gaius was wearing? Did you see what so-and-so was wearing? Oh, they brought their kid. Good for them. These were actual people at the procession. And it was rather, uh, think of it as a um, rather boastful or uh, something you could brag about. I was there. You can see my face in the Arapacis. Below these people are plants. Now, what does that have to do with peace? If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. The peace of Augustus. And so, when there is peace, there is growth. And if you look at these plants, for even more than a few seconds, your eyes move around them constantly. There's not a single focal point. And that seems to imply that the plants are not resting, perhaps they are growing. Yeah, so under the peace of Augustus, there is growth, there is bounty, there is plenty, there is goodness. And that fits with the propaganda that we have seen with other rulers. With one ruler, we have order, absolute law and power. Under this ruler, we have peace and prosperity. So again, art here is serving to have a rather educational or propaganda-like function as well as a decorative function. Another way a ruler could assert their influence and power or influence and means is through the column. 
In this case, we have columns that tell stories, much like ancient comics from Egypt or modern comics of now. If you were to walk around the column or go into one of the neighboring libraries, you could see the story of Trajan as it follows from the base, up and up and up in this drum cylinder. It is a collection of different stones fit into place, stacked on top. Originally with Trajan's sculpture on top, it has now been replaced with a saint. If you were to go to one of the libraries across this area, then you would be able to see the top. An interesting thing about this that we'll see at another place is that as the sun moves over, it creates altering shadows, different shadows that tell a story about you know, what those men and women were doing, bringing them to life as the sun moves across, whether in low relief or for those in higher relief. It creates a different effect, which is really incredible. Now, this particular relief comes from our next type of building that is commemorative, the Triumphal Arch. We go from the column to the arch, and the arch has a lot of symbolic meaning for a conqueror or a king. Um, what is, if you are a general attacking an ancient city, what's the most important thing? What's the first thing you go for? Well, you go for their water source, but really you're going for the gate. You need to get into the city. If you take the gate, you've taken the city and you have won. And so for many, the gate was a symbol of so much. And here, They've built an arch symbolizing a particular victory, in this case, over the Jews or the Jewish wars. Uh, later, other kings will adopt this practice of commemorating great victories or majesty with arches. As we look at the front, we can see one of the trophies from Jerusalem. It is the one of the holy candles of the Jewish faith, the menorah. What's interesting about this, though, is the way it has been sculpted. Um, I'm going to try and get up close here. Where is that? Someone's going to see it before I do. Uh, hold on a second. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so what's interesting about this is the menorah has been carved in flat relief, whereas the base of the menorah has been carved naturalistically. It's been carved to look like it's tilted. It's actually on the shoulders of those men carrying it. Now, why do that? Why make it flat and abstract and clumsy here, but make it realistic there? That's because they wanted you to understand exactly what it is they got. They went to great detail to make all of this realistic as they carry it, as the as some men that are carved in low relief look like they're farther away, and some men in higher relief are obviously closer, you know, bending their shoulders and their backs under the weight of this magnificent golden menorah. It looks so real, and then there is the symbol of this faith, the symbol of this city that has been now taken as a trophy. Well, again, we have techniques, both realistic and abstract, working together to communicate. Now, the Arch of Titus is rather plain looking, and there's a reason for that. As these arches were built, later rulers, or later arches, would become more expensive and more complex. And as a way to save money, some of the rulers, particularly here in the case of Constantine, he would take some of the decorations from the surface of those previous arches and have them installed into his, thus saving money and connecting his majesty and power to these other rulers, validating himself and creating more influence. And don't we see something like the pyramids and the mastabas kind of happening here? You know, one arch is cool, but, you know, three arches would be better. You know, make it a little bigger, a little cooler. We've seen this happen before. It's happening again. While we're here, there's something else that you need to see. And that is a development from what the Greeks established. The Greeks established the Doric, the Ionic, but the Romans will introduce a new type of column, which is a combination of the Doric or the Ionic and the Corinthian. That is the composite column. It combines the leaves with the scroll capital. 
It's not entirely original, but it is new. We can see this both at the arches of Titus and of Constantine, here as well as here. It's a rather more elegant or rather more decorative and more complex evolution. And if you look again, you know, going from plain to a little more, to a little more, and then to just, well, let's turn it up. It makes a lot of sense to see the development of that type of column. So we've spent a lot of time looking at architecture. Let's look briefly at sculpture and then finish up with painting. Their funerary art is more Greek. It's not Egyptian. While they didn't necessarily just bury their people, they did inter them or put them in tombs, specifically in their catacombs, these underground tombs, not necessarily uh, like cities of the dead, but a large, vast complex underground. These sarcophagi or coffins would often, uh, with richer people, be decorated complexly. And if we look at these sculptures, we can see uh, a work that kind of borders the line between Hellenistic and classical with the idealized forms, but more expressive than those general classical stereotypes. Interesting to note, the winged figures, uh, perhaps this is Mercury or... Hermes, the messenger, as well as some other gods. You don't have to go into we won't go into detail here, but it may be worth noting some of the gods that are expressed here and the Augustus, the Augustus of Prima Porter. Which god would it be of all the gods to give this scepter, this rod of rulership to Augustus Caesar? Note how cleverly the uh, cornucopia seems to come up right below his belly button and how the gods above on his chest seem to shine or look down approvingly on him. The sculpture portrait, the sculptural portrait, would sometimes be monochromatic, one color, or in other cases, multicolor. This again shows the wealth and the means of the empire, or in some cases, the wealth and the means of the individual. Someone that could afford, you know, regular marble, but more expensive marble from farther away uh, across the empire itself. In some cases, the, the marble would be simply skin, or it would be something like clothing or decoration. The sculptural portrait became not only uh, uh, a decorative piece, but a status symbol of sorts for many, and would create an establ or establish a, trad a long tradition of sculptural portraits. Notice here something that is clearly more Hellenistic for the very natural, less idealized portrait of this man. Notice the jowls, the acne, the balding peak, as well as the expressive eyes and bulging nose. Finally, from sculpture, we finish this chapter with painting. And before we finish this, I want you to have these words burn into your memory or burn into your thoughts as you read this chapter or think about these next few slides. What could have happened? What could have happened? Those four words. I want you to think about that, okay? So there are at Pompeii, and if you don't know what it was, Pompeii was an ancient Roman city that was encased or preserved by the ash, the lava, the explosion of the great volcano Vesuvius. It uh, was so sudden and so perfect in containing the city that we have a great number of ruins, mosaics, paintings, even bodies of people trapped, preserved in their, in their poses, in their sleep from this. This is a mosaic which uses bits of tile, ceramic tile or stone, arranged cleverly by color to create an image. So it's not necessarily a painting, but it has a bit of a painterly effect. We can see that it is very expressive. A little more complex than the Greeks, but clearly taking some pages from the Greek playbook. It is more Hellenistic. I mean, that is definitely not an ideal woman or man. That is an expressive, angry woman. But look at the, look at the softness in the cheek. Look at the, uh, the complexity 
and the range of little shades here and here. The mouth open, the lightness in the lips. It's really rather beautiful. But this is not painting. This is mosaic. We will now look at their painting. From Pompeii, we have organized four styles. And the first, we need to remember that these buildings did not have windows. So what did they do? They decorated their insides. They tried to create decoration for these drab, somewhat dark rooms. The first style typically were embellishments on the, the wall, the architecture itself. Maybe trim, maybe some lattice work, shelves that weren't really there, just some kind of basic decorations. Trim, that's what I mostly use the, the term for. The second style became more complex, a more complex development of that, a being able to trick the eye of the viewer. So by this point they've discovered fine shading, so a little darkness by their fruit could make it appear to be sitting on a step, sitting on a pedestal. A little light and dark could create a bit of a highlight on a piece of fruit, or make a bowl look more like a real bowl. And the simple shape of one dark color against a light could make you think, oh, here's a ledge, here's a step, here's a lid. And from the lessons learned in painting, they became more complex. From the first style, they learned how to make the trim, the architectural embellishments. This is all a flat surface, but painted to look real. And from that, they've created a stage, a place to put even more complex decorations. And in this case, it is a, dec a decoration of figures and people. Somewhat elegant, somewhat clumsy, Sometimes the lighting is inconsistent, the perspective is sometimes off, inconsistent, either because of a lack of understanding or simply because it was made at different times or made by different people. At the Villa of Mysteries, we can see a wide range of figures and uh, situations. We can see that they're very much paying close attention to anatomy, to shading, and to the nature of how to paint life as it really is. This is not an abstraction or a simplification, not the symbolic language of the Aegeans or of the hieroglyphics in, the, in Egypt, but rather an attempt to make art or painting as it really seems to be. I don't know why my voice cracked. Maybe I need to drink more water. Hold on. So from the third, from the second style, we move to the third style, a much more crafty, complex elegant development from that second style. Not so much the crowding of people, but now what do we have here? We have the trim, we have some false cabinets, and what more, what's more is, what is this, this white space? We have a wonderful painting of uh, a yard, a playground, a park, an opening, if you think back to the beginning of the chapter, what was that space, that private space, a peristyle and a plaza? So, if you think about it, this white space could be the wall itself and this could be a window. And for a person that lived inside the space, that did not have electrical lights, but had a simple lamp or candles, that might actually look realistic and could trick the eye of people who came over as guests. The more elegant the painting, the more impressive, and so not only does it serve to entertain and make one feel more at home, but it can be a status symbol. Which explains why the fourth style becomes more complex. Not so much in decoration, but just an advancement of the, all the lessons learned in the previous three styles. We see the, the false cabinets, the idols, the sculptures, the windows, as well as pictures. All of this is a flat surface painted to look, well, realistic. Which leads me to ask you, what parts of this image is realistic and what is, what is real and what is not? Now, I might take questions if you were in class. I'd probably ask for three of you to guess. I'll go ahead and tell you what is flat and what is real. 
This is all flat. This is all flat. This is flat as well, but this is real, as this comes in here. And this stands out in this little space. So I ask you, what could have happened if Rome had continued to, to develop? If Rome had not fallen in 476 AD, where would painting have been if Rome was allowed to continue to thrive, develop, and learn? Where would we be? If, in a thousand years, Leonardo was born in a civilization that did not suffer the dark ages and the loss of so much complexity and knowledge and technique, where would we be? It's just something I like to think about. You know, some people read fantasy novels or science fiction books or fiction based on what would happen if the Nazis won or what would there's uh, what would happen if the South had won or what would happen if you know hamburgers were made out of um, hamburgers were made square and not round. You know, alternate realities. My alternate reality would be what would happen in art if we were continued to develop in this way. Would we have reached a renaissance earlier? Would there even have been a renaissance? These are questions that are kind of fun to think about. But for now, you need to think about all of these terms and all of the ideas that we have just discussed. Whereas the Greeks were the brains, the Romans were the drains, but they weren't completely without merit in the original ideas. Their main advances were in architecture and engineering. The decoration of those spaces were incredible and impressive. We can see that this chapter mainly focuses on architecture, a little on sculpture, and a little on painting. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. Please don't forget that the online quizzes that can be found from the back of the book or from the syllabus are a great help. If you have any questions, again, please don't hesitate to drop by or email me, and I'll see you in class. Thanks.